In 1988, my husband, daughter, and I visited Walt Disney World's Epcot for the first time. What a mind-expanding, soul-refreshing experience it was. As is typical for a Disney park, at Epcot you step out of your mundane world into a glorious alternate universe where nothing but the finest aspects of what man has accomplished and the best of his hopes for accomplishing in the future are portrayed. Again, as with all Disney parks, the environment is beautifully, artistically landscaped and spotless and perfectly groomed at all times. Not a gum wrapper on the sidewalk, barely a petal out of place in the many gardens, in spite of the tens of thousands of visitors hosted every day of the year. Yet the grooming is so efficiently planned and scheduled and conducted that you almost never see a worker sweeping a sidewalk or trimming a hedge. The first half of the grounds, designated Future World, features large themed pavilions that house attractions that emphasize the history and the future of technology, invention, and progress. They include pavilions on the topics of energy, the seas, the land, imagination, and more. The construction of each pavilion was done under the financial sponsorship of some major corporation, and major corporations continue sponsoring the ongoing maintenance of the attractions. For instance, the central icon of Epcot, the geodesic sphere with its spaceship Earth attraction inside, was originally sponsored by AT&T, which was fitting as the main theme of the spaceship Earth ride contained in it was originally the history and future of communications. There have been many changes in sponsorship of attractions at Epcot over the years since it had its grand opening in 1982. For instance, Spaceship Earth was sponsored from 2005 through 2017 by the German multinational engineering and electronics conglomerate Siemens. The second half of the Epcot grounds is designated World Showcase. It consists of 11 pavilions surrounding a man-made lake. Each pavilion represents a specific country and features themed architecture, landscapes, streetscapes, and shops representing the country's culture and cuisine. Most of the staff members in each pavilion are natives of the country being represented. Some pavilions also have restaurants, live entertainment, and themed attractions related to the country. At the time in 1988, I had never seen anything as splendiferous and mind-blowing in my life. It took two days to cover all the pavilions and attractions in both sections of the park, and even then there were many nooks and crannies we didn't have time to explore. I guess I must have thought I'd now seen the pinnacle of what American ingenuity was able to create in terms of educational and cultural entertainment. Surely, I assumed, it took until the late 20th century to be able to have the know-how and technology and grandiose planning to pull together such an impressive tourist destination. How naive I was. Sometime in about the year 2000, I happened to be surfing around the internet and came across this photo of an event I had never heard of, the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, also commonly called the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The picture and the story that went with it were so startling that at first I couldn't quite comprehend what I was seeing. I'd never heard of this Chicago Fair, although I had heard of two World's Fairs that had been held in my own lifetime, one in Seattle in 1962 and one in New York in 1964, both when I was still in high school. But they were being held so far from where I lived back then, in the small town of Traverse City in a rural area in far northwestern Michigan, that they just barely registered on my conscious mind. When I heard the word fair back then, the only point of reference I had of personal experience was the event held each year at the fairgrounds just outside our town. It was basically a county fair, although the official title was the Northwestern Michigan Fair. The fairgrounds consisted mostly of a big fenced-in field of dirt with some grassy areas, a parking area, and a few permanent barn-like buildings at one end. Most of the year they sat empty, but for one week in the late summer the whole fairgrounds came to life. The farmers of the county and their kids, who were members of the 4-H club or the future farmers of America, filled the barns up with livestock, the best of their herds and flocks, vying for blue ribbons that would show 
They had raised the best of the best, and often the biggest of the biggest, or most unusual, such as the huge hogs, like this record-setting 1,335-pound porker who won top prize at the Ohio State Fair in 2012, or the exotic strange breeds on display in the chicken barn. There weren't just biggest animals either. You could always count on seeing the county's biggest pumpkin and biggest sunflower head. The livestock barns were mostly open-sided to allow the fresh air in and the not-so-fresh air out. I was always amazed the smelliest building of all wasn't where the pigs were kept, but the ones with the chickens. But there was one big enclosed building, often called the Exposition Building, where contestants, mostly women, vied for other prizes for such homemade and handmade creations as pies and quilts. The largest section of the Big Dirt Field was taken up with the Midway, a collection of exciting rides, small tents, and shacks featuring snacks and games of skill where you could win really big, really ugly stuffed animals. The rides were brought in all in pieces on trucks and put together overnight by a company from out of state, like a giant erector set. When I was in grade school in the mid-1950s, you could still go down to the far corner of the fairgrounds and find a girly show like these, and a side show or freak show with both live and preserved curiosities. I think the freak and girly shows disappeared in the mid-1960s. There was also another tent or building called a Penny Arcade that had such penny nickel dime attractions as pinball games. That's where you'd find the peep shows, little contraptions you'd peer into through a small hole, put your penny or nickel in, and turn a crank to watch a short silent movie, which was not on film. It consisted of a stack of photos on a rotating drum, which would flop down one at a time for you to see. As you turned the crank, the successive photos would give the illusion of movement, faster and faster depending on how fast you turn the crank. Later they added similar peep shows that actually had little film strips in them, usually playing very short movies starring cartoon characters from the silent film era such as Felix the Cat that you also controlled by turning a crank. I'm not quite sure why this was an attraction to most people in the mid-1950s. By then almost everyone had a television. But for some reason, putting your coin in and being able to control the action of two guys boxing or some poorly rendered cartoon characters acting goofy seemed exciting. And I suppose the most exciting for some adult males were the peep show boxes with little movies with themes you couldn't see on TV, with titles like Bedroom Secrets. These were usually clearly labeled with some notice like For Adults Only but it seemed like there was seldom anyone around to supervise just who could take a peep, so I don't doubt lots of boys took advantage of the situation. All of this excitement would swoop into our fairgrounds for one week in late August, and then, at the end of that week, everything was torn down, packed up, and removed, leaving just the muddy field and empty parking lots and barns. The county fair was the epitome of the term ephemeral. The main point of it all seemed to be to give the local farm folks an opportunity to brag about their productivity and vie with one another for honors, and to give the local populace a short time to party outdoors before winter set in. The importance and excitement wasn't in the facility itself. It was just a dirt field with ramshackle tents and buildings. No, the importance and excitement was in the bright colorful lights at night, the smell of popcorn, the bustling crowds, the thrilling rides. And if you were a farmer or farm kid, it was the chance to show off the fruits of your farming and livestock breeding skills and hard work. Yes, all this is what came to my mind when I heard the word fair. By the time I was in high school, I had still never even been to the Michigan State Fair but I'm pretty sure I figured that a state fair would be just a beefed-up version of our county fair, with a bigger dirt field, fairgrounds, bigger crowds, bigger animal barns, bigger tents, more quilts and pies, and more rides and peep shows. Thus, when I first heard the phrase World's Fair, what flitted through my mind was an equally ephemeral-looking scene, only bigger. I supposed it would be like those giant Barman Bailey circus events, with a tent that could hold 10,000 or more, 
surrounded by even more rides and popcorn stands, and even more tents or sheds holding even bigger pigs and pumpkins. I guess if I would have paid attention to Time and Life magazine articles with glossy photos in 1964 about the New York World's Fair that ran from April to October that year, I would have known better. But 1964 was the spring I graduated from high school, and the fall that I went away to college, and the year the Beatles came to America in February and August. I had a lot on my mind, and some event 850 miles away from my small northern Michigan hometown that I would never get to attend was totally irrelevant to me at the time. So when I ran across the Columbian Exposition of 1893 on the web in about 2000, my mind was a blank slate regarding World's Fairs. Actually, it was pretty much a blank slate regarding fairs in general. In all those years since childhood leading up to 2000, I had attended only a couple more county fairs and had still never even been to a state fair. And I knew nothing about the history of any kind of fairs. But I've learned a lot since 2000 and have found it fascinating. As it turns out, people have been partying down at fairs for a long time. Since ancient times and in civilizations all over the globe, it has been typical for people to gather perhaps once a week to hold what is usually called in English a market, a special time and place to buy and sell and barter food and crafted items such as pottery or blankets or furniture with people who live in your own village or town or nearby villages or towns. But markets are not the same as what we have come to know in the 21st century as fairs. The English word fair can be traced back to the late Latin word feria that implies a religious festival, holiday, or holy day. What we now refer to as fairs have their roots in the early centuries in Catholic Europe. Throughout the year, the church had a cycle of special celebrations honoring religious themes and famous saints. On these days, the peasants had a break from having to do manual labor, and religious gatherings and rituals were held in small churches and large cathedrals. If the celebration was important enough to draw visitors from far and wide, it would be an occasion for people to take advantage of those crowds by setting up a large marketplace full of agricultural products and crafted items, often right in a courtyard in front of a cathedral. The word feria that originally applied to the holiday itself broadened to include the whole of the activities surrounding it, including the marketplace and all the activities there. Traveling merchants from all parts of Europe, bringing a wide variety of goods from foreign lands, including spices, textiles, pottery, metal items, and much more, would even make plans to arrive at various locations on their travel route in time to take part in these ferias, or fairs. Other entrepreneurs would also take advantage of the bustling crowds to make some money, including entertainers, such as musicians, troubadours, jugglers, and acrobats, and even the occasional man with a trained bear. And local bakers and cooks would set up the equivalent of snack bars to feed the hungry and thirsty crowds. By the time of the 17th century, the term fair had become unhitched enough from its roots as a religious celebration to be also applied to celebrations that were totally secular in purpose. All that was necessary was a planned gathering that included the crowds, the wares for sale, the entertainment, the food, and perhaps some competitions such as horse races, and you had a fair. In England, this came to include what were known as frost fairs. The era informally referred to by scientists and historians as the Little Ice Age that occurred between about 1300 and 1850 brought much colder winters to the British Isles than in centuries before and after. Between 1309 and 1814, it got so cold that the part of the Thames River flowing through London froze completely at least 23 times. As you can see in this engraving, in 1608 the river froze so solid that many Londoners decided to venture out on it and frolic. And thus, on five of those 23 frozen occasions, the ice was thick enough to hold a whole elaborate fair. The most famous of these frost fairs occurred when the Thames became frozen for two whole months 
eventually to a depth of 11 inches in the winter of late 1683 and early 1684. As it became clear that the ice was solid enough to hold great weight, Londoners decided to turn the river into a fairgrounds. Entrepreneurs quickly set up many amusements and thousands gathered daily to party down. There were horse races, puppet plays, fortune tellers, jugglers, acrobats, all kinds of gambling, nine-pin bowling games, temporary pubs serving up plenty of beer, grog, rum, and more, hot food stands, chocolate and tobacco shops, souvenir shops, shoemakers, fruit sellers, and even barbers. Oh, yes, and there were even temporary brothels that would do a brisk business until the local constabulary shut them down. People drove carriages on the ice, some with wheels and others with sleds, and slipped and slided on foot, both with and without skates. During the 1683 fair, as well as several later frost fairs, local printers drug their printing presses out on the ice, set up shop, and sold engraved and letterpressed frost fair attendance certificates like these, often personalized on the spot with the purchaser's name as souvenirs. The last of the frost fairs was held for several days in early February in 1814. As in 1683, plenty of merchants were quick to set up amusements and provisions of food and drink, including plenty of beer and other alcoholic beverages again. There were dances, ox roasts, and at one point, an elephant was marched across the river. A printer named George Davis published a 124-page book titled Frostiana, or A History of the River Thames in a Frozen State. The entire book was typeset and printed in Davis's printing stall, which had been set up on the frozen Thames. If you have been a fan of the BBC's Doctor Who series, you may have already been introduced to the idea of the Frost Fairs. In the Doctor Who episode titled A Good Man Goes to War, the character River Song mentions that she's just time travel to 1814 for the last of the great Frost Fairs. The Doctor had taken her there for ice skating on the Thames. Another episode titled Thin Ice is set during that same final Frost Fair and includes a glimpse of the elephant crossing the Thames. Yes, all this European fair lore is fascinating. But what we are looking for in particular in this video series is the roots of the fairs in the United States. So let's cross the Atlantic and see what was happening there in the same era as that final London Frost Fair. The very first rudimentary fair in America that was related to agriculture was held in Massachusetts in 1811. It consisted almost entirely of a competition event, featuring monetary prizes among farmers of the region to see who had the best sheep, oxen, cattle, and swine. It aroused such enthusiasm among the farm families of the area that it became an annual event. By the second year or so, displays and competitions of needlework and baking among the ladies in attendance were added and soon merchants were invited to also participate and sell their wares, just like in the medieval fairs in Europe. And it took off from there. Word got around about the success of the Massachusetts Fair, and that simple beginning led directly, within a very few years, to the establishment of similar regional agricultural fairs all across America. Just as with the London fairs, it didn't take long for entrepreneurs to realize fairs were a perfect venue to set up shop with entertainments such as games and rides, food and drink and souvenir stands, and more. Building on the county fair idea, the first state fair was held in New York in 1841 and instantly became an annual event. My home state of Michigan held the second such state fair in the country in 1849, which also became instantly an annual event right up to today. Here's a sample of the Michigan State Fair Family Fun from 1910. But as I studied more about the world's fairs that have been held in the United States, 
I found that they weren't really directly connected to the agricultural fairs that began here in 1811. To find their most immediate roots, we need to cross the Atlantic to England again, but by way of France. After the French Revolution in the late 1700s, the French leadership decided one of the ways to unify the French population and encourage the average man to be enthusiastic about the reputation of France as a major industrial power in the world would be to hold great public events that shone a spotlight on the great modern accomplishments of the French economy. The first of these events was held in Paris in 1798 and was called, in English, the Exhibition of Products of French Industry. 100 French exhibitors displayed manufacturing equipment, new inventions, and the products of the various industries in open galleries in a building made up of large porch-like structures surrounding an open courtyard. Exhibits included such items as bonnets, spun cotton, pencils, pottery, an instrument for cataract operations, paintings made from the plumes of exotic birds, a huge machine for extracting logs from rivers, and a device that demonstrated the new metric system of meters, grams, and liters. Awards were given to those items favored by an official group of judges who were told by the exhibition organizers to favor products that were comparable to those of British industry. This would emphasize France's ability to compete favorably on the world stage in the midst of the budding Industrial Revolution. Eleven such events were held in France between 1798 and 1849. Each was strictly for French products. They were very popular with the French public as well as visitors from other countries, and the crowds grew every year. The eleventh and last exposition lasted for 60 days in the summer of 1849. In 1798, 110 exhibitors had participated. In 1849, this number had exponentially grown to 5,494 exhibitors. For this last exposition, there was a new name, as entries from the fields of agriculture and horticulture were added. The leadership of this exposition chose to declare that agriculture and industry were the twin pillars on which France had built her prosperity. So there were exhibitions of farm equipment, with the largest machines displayed in a separate building, and there were even separate quarters where live farm animals were displayed. The fine arts were represented too, including painting and sculpture, as seen in the surroundings in this illustration of the awards ceremony at the end of the exposition. And music was also included. For instance, musical innovator Adolf Sax's saxophone was shown in public for the first time at the exposition. Other exhibition categories included machines, precision instruments, fabrics, chemical arts, metal, and raw materials and other products from Algeria, France's recent colonial conquest. The French expositions in Paris from 1798 to 1849 were impressive and drew attention from visitors from around Europe. By the early 1820s, it became obvious that some of those visitors were going back to their homelands and agitating their countrymen to get on board the industrial exposition craze and sponsor their own events. Some were obviously persuasive. Between 1822 and 1849, expositions sprung up all over Europe, from Sweden to Spain, Russia to Belgium, Sardinia to Austria. But note one thing about all of these expositions. Every one of them was, as Paris had been, a national exposition. The total emphasis was on public relations for only the output of the individual nation. It took one more step in the history of fairs to get to the actual, immediate precursor to the eventual numerous world's fairs that were hosted in the United States and that are the focus of this video series. That one short step was from Paris in 1849 to London in 1851. British visitors to the 1849 Paris Exposition had returned home 
talking up the idea of organizing an industrial exposition in London. But they were promoting much bigger plans. The British wanted to do something that had not been done before. They wanted their nation to host an international exposition that would welcome exhibitors from all nations. They wanted to create a world's fair. Perhaps the most enthusiastic supporter of this idea was His Royal Highness Prince Albert. As husband of Queen Victoria and president of the Royal Society of Arts, he used his very great influence to lobby both the Parliament and the wealthy businessmen of London to approve of and invest in making this dream come true. He was successful in his efforts and plans were begun in 1849 to hold the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, informally referred to usually as the Great Exhibition, in Hyde Park, London, less than two miles from Buckingham Palace. And it was going to be the very first World's Fair. Not everyone among the upper classes in England was enthused about the idea, with good reason. A wave of revolutionary proletarian uprisings had caused chaos in the past decade across Europe. Just such a revolutionary movement called the Chartists had been active in England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales from 1838 through 1848. Chartism got its name from the so-called People's Charter, that listed the six main aims of the movement. It demanded, among other things, the vote for all men over 21, no property qualifications to become a member of parliament, and electoral districts of equal size. The Chartists presented three petitions to parliament in 1839, 1842, and 1848, but each was rejected. The petition presented in 1842 was said to have gathered 3.3 million signatures, around a third of Britain's adult population and four times larger than the combined British and Irish electorate. In 1848, the plan was to hold a peaceful mass demonstration on Kensington Commons, a field in London across the Thames from the Parliament on April 10th. Then the Chartists, bringing the new petition, would march en masse across the bridge to deliver it to Parliament. The Chartists had predicted a crowd of 200,000. There was concern among the British authorities that a gigantic crowd of that size might become agitated by rabble-rousing speeches and violence might ensue. In anticipation of the possibility of such an uprising, the Queen and Prince Albert were evacuated to the Isle of Wight. The government moved several royal regiments into London. Armed soldiers were stationed on the roof of the Bank of London while bank employees piled sandbags around the bank. Cannon were readied around Buckingham Palace. The entrances to government buildings were blocked with books and files of papers. Governmental ministers' homes were especially protected, and rifles were issued to the clerks in the general post office. Meanwhile, more than 100,000 citizens were sworn in as special constables to assist the police. Each was provided a white armband and a club to use, if necessary, to help disperse protesters. After the fact, the satirical London Punch periodical found much to parody in its political cartoons about the events. When April 10th arrived, it was a cold, rainy day, and the crowd on the common wasn't as large or as rowdy as anticipated, and not large enough to chance challenging the 8,000 armed British soldiers and the more than 100,000 special constables. The police commissioner politely informed the main Chartist leader, Irishman Fergus O'Connor, that the crowd would simply not be allowed to cross any bridges over the Thames to access the Parliament. Overpowered, the Chartist leaders backed down. A failed uprising of Chartists in 1839 had ended with 22 Chartists killed by royal troops and their leaders convicted of treason and banished for life to a penal colony. The leaders of the 1848 demonstration 
didn't want a repeat of that debacle, so Fergus agreed to just cross the bridge in an escorted carriage and deliver the petition by himself. The last Chartist demonstration was considered a failure. Parliament rejected the last petition, and the Chartism movement lost its steam. By the early 1850s, it had morphed into what one writer described as an earnest but minority pressure group agitating for what they called the Charter and something more. This more included free education for all, universal old age pensions, and state support for those unable to work or to find work. Looking back now, we know the Chartist movement fizzled away. None of their demands were implemented before the 20th century, and it was 1918 before the Charter's central demand for universal male suffrage to become law. But the Londoners of 1851 didn't have the advantage of hindsight. The decade of Chartist agitation was still fresh on many minds. 1848 had been only three years before the Great Exhibition was to be held, and anger and dissatisfaction among the working classes had continued across Europe. And meanwhile, Karl Marx himself had taken up residence in London in 1849, right after publishing his Communist Manifesto in 1848. In addition, the headquarters of the Communist League had also moved to London that same year. So it was not totally unreasonable that some in the British upper classes were concerned about inviting huge crowds to London. As one writer put it, something revolutionary and bloody might be the result of the collection of vast bodies of men, with a large proportion of foreign republicans among them, into the bosom of the metropolis. There was even concern that the royal family might be massacred, and some advisers urged Victoria to leave the city and stay far away during the period of the exhibition. But Prince Albert and the Queen refused to give in to the paranoia, cooler heads prevailed, and the plans for the great exhibition went forward. And thus we arrive at the world's first World's Fair in 1851. Of course, this grandiose plan didn't really include exhibits from all the nations of the world, but the exhibition eventually did include participants from all the colonies and dependencies of Britain, such as Canada, Australia, and India, and 44 other countries and their possessions from around the world, such as the United States, Chile, France, China, Russia, and Turkey. In all, 14,000 individual exhibitors from all those various countries brought over 100,000 individual items to display and not all of the displays were of industrial machines and products. The Royal Society of Arts believed it important to also include works of art of all kinds, particularly statuary, in the exhibition hall. So, just where were these items all going to be displayed? Surely they couldn't just set up rows and rows of tents in Hyde Park, as the entrepreneurs did on the frozen Thames for the old London frost fairs of earlier times. No, they had much more grandiose plans than that. After considering a number of options, the organizers of the exhibition settled on architectural plans for a giant exhibition hall. Made out of a wispy-looking structure of wrought iron, framing 300,000 panes of plate glass. If it looks like a gigantic greenhouse to you, that is natural, because the architect had previously specialized in making large greenhouses and decided to adapt the methods he'd been using for those to work on a much grander scale. Yes, much grander. It was a single structure covering 19 acres of land, more than the area of five football fields. In order to not disturb the beauty of the 100-foot-tall, full-grown elm trees in Hyde Park, the roof was made high enough, 168 feet at its highest point, that the builders could just leave the trees in place and construct the building around them. Jokingly dubbed the Crystal Palace by a London newspaper when the reporter first saw the plans for the building, the name stuck. The London Crystal Palace was the largest glass building in the world at the time, but took much less time to build from the ground up than you might expect, 
because it was constructed of numerous ingeniously designed modular sections made of prefabricated standardized parts. A bit like the carnival rides mentioned earlier in the episode, putting the palace together was in some ways much like working with an enormous erector set. And thus it was ready, right on time for the official grand opening day, May 1st, 1851. And what a grand opening it was. The crowd admitted on the first day was only to be people with season tickets, but only is relative, because there were 30,000 admitted. And reports indicate there may have been as many as 300,000 amassed outside just to watch all the notables arrive in their finery. Oh, and in spite of all the hand-wringing ahead of time in some circles, the crowd was reported to have been extremely well-behaved and respectful at all times. An elaborate, solemn ceremony was held inside the Crystal Palace that day, led by Queen Victoria. The Queen shared her husband Albert's great enthusiasm for the fair, Earlier that year, Albert had declared to those preparing for the fair his extremely ambitious motivation and goals for the great exhibition. We are living at a period of most wonderful transition, which tends rapidly to accomplish that great end to which all history points, the realization of the unity of mankind. Gentlemen, the exhibition of 1851 is to give us a true test of the point of development at which the whole of mankind has arrived in this great task, and a new starting point from which all nations will be able to direct their further exertions. And Victoria echoed Albert's sentiments with a declaration of her own hopes for the influence the fair would have on the whole world. By God's blessing, this undertaking may conduce to the welfare of my people and to the common interests of the human race by encouraging the arts of peace and industry and strengthening the bonds of union among the nations of the earth. Yes, Victoria and Albert optimistically believed they were actually leading the world toward peace, comfort, and international cooperation by celebrating technology through this great exhibition that England was hosting. So, what kind of technology was exhibited that could, as Victoria enthused, encourage the arts of peace and industry, and what sort of fellows were bringing these exhibits from around the world? Well, here's how one writer has described one of the most popular exhibits at the fair. In the American section, crowds craned their necks to watch a loud, charismatic man expound on a revolutionary new product, a pistol that could fire not once, not twice, but fully six times in rapid succession without reloading. What was more, he demonstrated that he could assemble this remarkable weapon from parts plucked at random out of an array of bins, such was the uniformity of the machined components. The brash American behind this amazing feat was Samuel Colt. The husky, fast-talking industrialist from Connecticut embodied every European stereotype of the American. He was charming and abrasive, self-made and confident, eminently practical in his thinking, as imaginative as he was mercenary, an opportunist, a liar, and a genius. Five years earlier, he had found himself flat broke, a three-time loser. Now his name was as familiar in the royal courts of Europe as it was in the backwaters of the American West, and he was on his way to becoming one of the richest industrialists in the world. You may have recognized at least the last name of this exhibitor. Yes, that Colt, Samuel Colt, who brought a lovely collection of the finest weapons produced at his firearms factory. including this elegantly ornamented revolver, the so-called Baby Dragoon. He brought this exact one and several like it in their presentation cases 
with all the accessories you see here to bestow as gifts upon several Brits of distinction, including one to Prince Albert himself and another to Albert's son Edward, who became King Edward VII in 1901 after the death of Victoria. Instead of the old-fashioned method of making pistols and rifles with skilled gunsmiths crafting one at a time, Colt had invented machines to streamline the whole process. His factory in America produced standard, totally interchangeable, precise parts which could be swiftly assembled by unskilled workmen churning out high-quality, dependable firearms by the thousands, one of the earliest examples of this type of process in the industrial age, long before Henry Ford and his cars. Colt made such an impression on the British that within a year after the fair, he had opened a firearms factory in London, becoming the very first American manufacturer to establish an overseas branch. Prince Albert and Queen Victoria had hoped that the great products of industry of the amazing new age that the Great Exhibition was heralding would help bring about unity and peace among the citizens of the world. But Colt didn't quite share this optimism. As he put it, the good people of this world are very far from being satisfied with each other, and my arms are the best peacemakers. But there were tens of thousands of less militant displays at the exhibition. Let's take a stroll around the hallways to see what we can see in the way of the works of arts and industry from around the world. But it would be good to wear sturdy shoes just on the ground floor that you see here, not including the galleries on the second story, there were eight miles of display tables. New York Tribune newspaper editor Horace Greeley, one of many Americans who visited the Great Exhibition, lamented in a news story he sent back to the States, that after spending five full days wandering through the Crystal Palace, he hadn't come close to seeing all he wanted to see. Popular British exhibits included a printing machine that could turn out 5,000 copies of the periodical Illustrated London News in an hour, and another for printing and folding envelopes and applying glue to them, and a machine for making the newfangled cigarettes. Part of the India display included a huge taxidermied elephant in full royal regalia, as well as an imposing ivory throne. There was one whole very large and very noisy room of moving machinery of all shapes and sizes and kinds whirring away. Up on the second floor balcony area, you could admire a gallery of stained glass windows and all sorts of newfangled musical instruments, including pianos with collapsible keyboards convenient for rich men to install on their yachts, and other ingenious gadgets of all kinds, such as a church pulpit connected to pews by rubber tubes so that the deaf could hear the sermon, an expanding coffin, waterproof paper, self-suspending trousers, a defensive umbrella with a sharply pointed end to foil hoodlums, and even a false nose made of silver. One particularly unusual invention was the Tempest Prognosticator, Tempest meaning storm, and Prognosticator meaning predictor. It was known also by its more descriptive name, the Leech Barometer. Yes, that kind of leech. This strange contraption had been invented by a family doctor and surgeon named, appropriately enough, George Merriweather. As you may be aware, leeches were widely used in a number of medical procedures involving drawing blood in the 19th century, and thus Merriweather had them around the house for his medical practice, kept in bottles. He had studied them closely and noticed that it seemed that they relaxed at the bottom of their bottles in fine, calm weather, but half a day or so before a change in the weather, they would move steadily upwards towards the surface of the water in the bottle and try to climb out. When the weather became calm again, the leech would relax and drift slowly down again to the bottom of his bottle. It occurred to Merriweather, who was a dabbler in unconventional inventions, 
that this behavior could be harnessed to make a barometer to predict inclement weather. It worked this way. Twelve leeches were kept in small corked bottles inside the device. At the top of each bottle was a small piece of whalebone attached to a wire, which went through the cork and on up to a small hammer attached to a bell. When each leech became agitated by an approaching storm, it would rise to the top of the bottle and, stopped by the cork from escaping, would flail around banging into the whalebone. This tugged on the wire, which pulled on the small hammer, which struck the bell, causing a ringing. The more leeches that were sufficiently agitated, the more likelihood a storm was coming. So the more times the bell was rung, the more likely the approach of a storm. After the exhibition, Dr. Merriweather mounted a campaign to convince the British government to establish a network of leech warning stations around the English coast. They never took him up on the suggestion. A less unconventional invention displayed at the exhibition was a double-action jacquard loom. This was a new improvement on a machine invented in 1804 by Joseph Marie Jacquard. A jacquard machine was a gadget fitted to a power loom that simplified the process of manufacturing textiles with complex patterns, such as brocade and damask. The loom was controlled by a chain of cardboard punch cards in the machine. Multiple rows of holes were punched on each card, with one complete card corresponding to one row of the design. As you might guess, the ability to change the pattern of the loom's weave by simply changing cards was an important conceptual precursor to the development of computer programming and data entry of today. In the 1830s, mathematician, inventor, and mechanical engineer Charles Babbage created a design for what is now considered the first computer that he called the analytical engine, calling for punch cards to be used as part of the mechanical process used by the engine. He did not manage to build the complete engine before his death, but was able to make this trial model of a small portion of it. By the 1880s, a simple data processing machine using punched cards was invented by a man named Herman Holerith and used to help process data in the 1890s U.S. Census. Some kinds of computer programming were done using punch cards clear up until the 1960s. This is a photo of a portrait of Joseph Marie Jacquard, but not a painted portrait. This portrait was actually woven in silk on a Jacquard loom in 1849. It required 24,000 punched cards to create it. Only a limited number of the silk portraits were made, and Charles Babbage owned one of them. It has long been acknowledged that it was part of what inspired him in using perforated cards in his analytical engine. Inventor Alfred Barlow created the so-called double-action Jacquard loom shown at the Great Exhibition. Shown here is the gadgetry attached to the top of the loom consisting of two Jacquard machines, each with its own set of cards. You are likely familiar with modern versions of the Swiss Army knife. Not really just a knife, even the earliest versions had a screwdriver and can opener. No, the Swiss Army knife was not displayed as an invention at the Crystal Palace. It wasn't invented until 1890. They had this instead. Behold the Norfolk knife, made by a Sheffield, England manufacturer named Joseph Rogers and Sons, official cutler for the British royal family. It was named after Norfolk Street, where the Rogers factory was located. As you may guess, it was a one-of-a-kind item, just created to show off the skill of the makers. It is 30 inches tall, has 75 blades and tools, and took two years to complete. The larger knife blades have intricate engravings on them, depicting Queen Victoria, the White House, and other iconic images. Although the Norfolk knife was elegant, it certainly can't hold a candle in size to the other special knife at the exhibition, the John Weiss and Son Company knife. Also created as a one-of-a-kind item for the fair, in honor of the date of the exhibition, it boasted 1,851 blades. The variety of inventions seemed never-ending. There was even a bedstead fitted with an alarm that on the set hour would cause a mechanism to unceremoniously dump the sleeper out of bed. Just as an aside, the flooring of the Crystal Palace was deliberately constructed 
of boards set half an inch apart on the ground floor so that machines could sweep dust and dirt through the spaces to drop to the ground underneath the building at the end of each day. But it was soon obvious that the long trailing skirts of the women visitors did a great cleaning job all by themselves. Well, we've now made a quick dash around the Crystal Palace to get just a taste of what was presented to the public in this first actual World's Fair. Before we move on to the next stage of the development of the World's Fairs of the United States, we'll stop by the United States exhibit at this British Fair. And as a final example of what appealed most to many of the early Victorians attending the Great Exhibition, here she is. She being the so-called Greek slave statue. She stood on a small rotating pedestal, set off from everything around her under a lavish red canopy, surrounded by lush red curtains. Surprisingly, she was not in the display area for some European country famous for statuary, like Italy or even Great Britain. She was part of the U.S. exhibit, and therein lies a little concluding story. By the mid-1830s, American Hiram Powers had made a reputation for himself as one of the most accomplished sculptors in the young United States. In order to further broaden his artistic education, he moved to Italy in 1837 and remained there for the rest of his life. In 1843, he sculpted a clay version of a life-size statue that he described as depicting a young woman from Greece, captured by the Ottoman Turks during the Greco-Turkish Wars of 1821 to 1832. She was portrayed nude, with wrists shackled together, as she would have been if on display in a slave market in Constantinople. She is subtly identified as being a Christian, as she is clasping a cross on a chain in one hand. This clay statue was reproduced by Powers Studio as a marble statue. He also created four more versions of the same basic clay statue, which were also turned into marble versions. Although Powers worked and lived in Italy, he also remained identified as an American sculptor. So the United States decided to enter one of his famous Greek slave statues, which had been winning accolades for several years all over Europe, as well as the U.S., as part of the U.S. exhibit at the fair. It was a wise choice, as frankly, the U.S. exhibit didn't have much else going for it, either in fine art or practical items on display. Other than the Greek slave statue, the only item that got much attention was the large American flag display looming over the exhibit area, hanging down from a large eagle with spread wings. But it almost directly up to the Greek slave little enclosure was a totally unrelated display that included a teepee and mannequins representing Native Americans in ceremonial outfits. Nearby was a display of portraits of presidents, a cylinder engine, displays of firearms by Colt and other manufacturers, other displays of such things as locks and clocks, a cotton gin, and a piano designed for four people to play at once. The items in the U.S. display were spread very thinly, and by some estimates only took up a fourth of the space that had been assigned to the country. You can see how sparse it was by comparing this illustration of another hallway in the palace. The satirical British magazine Punch, sort of a Victorian mad magazine, made fun of the U.S. exhibit in its pages during the fair's run. At one point, they suggested that the items in the U.S. exhibit could be consolidated just a bit, and all the empty space could be turned into a sort of bed and breakfast for people visiting the fair, as they sarcastically suggested. By packing up the American articles a little closer, by displaying Colt's revolvers over the soap, and by piling up the Cincinnati pickles on top of the Virginia honey, we shall concentrate all the treasures of American art and manufacture into a very few square feet and beds may be made to accommodate several hundreds in the space assigned for, but not one quarter filled by, the products of United States industry. We would propose, therefore, that the Yankee commissioners be empowered to advertise America as affording accommodation to those who wish to spend a week visiting the Great Exhibition. By an arrangement with the commissioners, whose duties must be rather light, breakfast could no doubt be provided for the lodgers before starting on their rounds. 
and the sign of the spread eagle would be an appropriate one to adopt for the hotel department of the speculation. Throughout the fair, Punch also directed satirical barbs and cartoons at the fact that the American section in the Crystal Palace displayed all sorts of American products, but made no reference at all to the three million Negro slaves who helped to produce many of them. Great Britain had abolished the slave trade in 1807 and passed a bill emancipating all slaves throughout the empire in 1833. With this fresh in mind, it was easy to attack the U.S. for its continued indulgence in what Americans called the peculiar institution, including the Fugitive Slave Act that had been just voted in place in the U.S. in 1850. The appearance of the lily-white Greek slave statue in the American section particularly lent itself to parody, including this political cartoon suggesting a companion statue that could be displayed alongside the naked white lady statue. But criticism regarding slavery wasn't just limited to print. On July 18, 1851, the American abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator, published a description of a demonstration organized by American abolitionists held in front of the Greek slave statue in the Crystal Palace. The demonstrators represented a variety of nations and ages. Escaped American slaves William and Ellen Craft and William Wells Brown walked arm in arm with white families from Bristol and Dublin. Surgeons and lawyers joined their wives, children, and friends in the demonstration. A total of 16 people formed the group, gathered in front of the Greek slave and a display titled Illustrious Americans, a series of daguerreotypes by Matthew B. Brady, the demonstrators challenged the status of the works as examples of America's democratic ideals. The abolitionist performance turned the American exhibition from a proud self-statement of artistry and democracy to a bold critique of America and its slave system. But it's time to move on forward in time to the next stage of the development of the World's Fairs. Over the period of six months that the Great Exhibition was going on at the Crystal Palace, six million people, equal to one-third of the entire population of Britain, paid a shilling apiece to attend. Average daily attendance was over 40,000, with over 100,000 visiting on the busiest day, October 7th. The Great Exhibition was such an incredible success that the profits from it provided for the creation of three famous museums which are popular destinations for crowds in London to this day. There's the London Natural History Museum, the Science Museum, and the Victoria and Albert Museum of Art and Design. And what about the Crystal Palace itself? As mind-boggling as it sounds, after the end of the Great Exhibition, it was deconstructed just like an erector set again, and all the components were moved from Hyde Park to another part of London. There, just like with an erector set, builders were able to reconfigure all the parts to make a much different looking building. From the 1850s clear up to 1936, the new Crystal Palace was a venue for numerous exhibitions, festivals, concerts, and even a circus at one time. In 1857, young British evangelist Charles Spurgeon, the most popular preacher in England even though he was only 23 at the time, successfully preached a sermon at the new Crystal Palace as part of a national day of fasting and prayer called by Queen Elizabeth to a crowd of 23,654 without any kind of amplification. The acoustics were that good. Later on, the first championship British cat show ever was even hosted in the new Crystal Palace in 1871. And during World War I, 
The building was drafted into service to function as a naval training facility. More than 125,000 men from the Royal Naval Division, Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve, and Royal Naval Air Service went through training there. And shortly after the war, it was drafted again to host the Imperial War Museum and Great Victory Exhibition. But it all came to an end on November 29, 1936. That night, a small fire that started in a woman's cloakroom suddenly mushroomed into an inferno that engulfed the building, feeding on the old dry timber flooring. Eighty-nine fire engines and over 400 firemen were rushed to the scene, but in the high winds they were unable to do anything to stop the destruction. 100,000 people came to the area nearby to watch the blaze. Among them, Winston Churchill, who said with tears in his eyes as he watched, This is the end of an age. By the next morning, nothing was left standing but one of the two towers that flanked the building. It was a sad and poignant ending for the beautiful Crystal Palace of the London Great Exhibition, but it had indeed had a glorious beginning back in 1851. Yes, just about everything about the first ever World's Fair had been a big hit. So, it should not be surprising that when many Americans who made the transatlantic trip to London to experience the great exhibition of 1851 for themselves, came back home, they began dreaming about and agitating for the United States to consider holding its own splendiferous World's Fair. In the next installment of this series, we'll see their dream come to reality. <laughs>